Happy Friday, everyone. It's good to have you with us. I'm Jane McCarthy. And I'm Tom Sherry. Well, the man accused of murdering his girlfriend in the Spokane Valley refused to come to court today. Yeah, new documents also show the woman found dead Wednesday had spoken with police about domestic violence and the man now accused of killing her. 28-year-old Joseph Scheel is charged now with first-degree murder. Crem 2's Amanda Rowley has today's developments. New court documents state Joseph Scheel used furniture to barricade himself inside the apartment. Once law enforcement got inside, they found him with two knives, the apartment scattered with blood stains, and the victim dead. Investigators say they found the victim in a small room covered with a blanket. She is identified as 48 year old Edna Hernandez. They found a large injury on her neck consistent with a knife wound, along with other knife related injuries to her hands and body. Within a foot of her body, investigators discovered a pair of scissors and a knife. An autopsy on the victim's body revealed she had several defensive type wounds on her arms, stab wounds to her right cheek and trauma to the top back side of her head. Using forensic chemicals, investigators also found evidence indicating an attempt to clean up blood in the bathroom sink. Records say Scheel had several scratches to his upper torso area and face. He told police he was concerned for his safety in jail and even admitted his use of methamphetamine contributes to his paranoia issues. According to court documents, prior to the victim's death, the two were supposed to be moved out of the apartment by the end of March. The apartment manager told investigators after talking to them about this, the victim showed her injuries to her arm and leg and acted scared or intimidated by Scheel. Docs also state the victim spoke to police about domestic violence incidents with Sheil in March and February this year. She told police he injured her and was trading drugs for sex with another woman. Sheil's criminal history shows he has traffic violations in Spokane County and recent drug charges in Kootenai County. While he refused to appear in district court this afternoon, his bond remains at $1 million. Reporting from the Spokane County Courthouse, Amanda Rowley, Crime 2 News. An anticipated plea by a murder suspect in Colorado will not happen for another month. A judge granted a request by Patrick Frazee's defense to push back today's arraignment. Now Frazee's court appearance is not scheduled until May 24th. The Colorado man is accused of murdering his fiancee, Kelsey Barrett, in November of last year. Since the arraignment is pushed back to May, the district attorney in the case believes a trial will likely take place in the fall. The DA is still deciding whether Frazee would face the death penalty. An investigation is wrapping up more than one year after a Washington family's SUV flew off a cliff in California. A jury just ruled the six adopted children were intentionally killed by their mothers. The jury of 14 chose from four manners of death, natural causes, suicide, accident, or an intentional act by another. Well, before her wife drove an SUV off the cliff, Sarah Hart spent hours looking up key information on her phone. An investigative report says she was searching for overdosing options, mm. as well as whether it was relatively painless to die by drowning. The report states Jennifer Hart was driving the SUV and deliberately stepped on the gas as it approached the cliff. A toxicology report shows she was legally drunk at the time of the crash. It happened days after Washington Child Welfare Authorities opened an investigation on the couple. Well, this man getting a lot of attention after claiming to be a boy who'd been missing for years. This man's name is Brian Michael Reaney. Now, Reaney has been charged by the FBI now for making false statements to a federal agent. He appeared in federal court today. So Reaney claimed to be Timothy Pitson. Pitson has been missing since 2011. Reaney told federal agents he had been missing since then and was held captive by two men. At first, the 23-year-old refused to give any DNA samples, but then eventually agreed. Testing came back negative when compared to Timothy's parents' DNA. Reaney admitted to staging the hoax and said he heard Timothy's story on an episode of 2020. This is not the first time this man has done something similar. Federal agents say Rini has presented himself as a juvenile victim of sex trafficking twice in the past.
He could face eight years in federal prison for this latest stunt. As for Timothy's family, they're not giving up hope of eventually finding him. We know that you are out there somewhere, Tim, and we will never stop looking for you, praying for you, and loving you. FBI agents working the case say the outpouring of support regarding Timothy's case gives everyone hope that the missing boy will eventually be found. Well, for the first time, Boeing CEO is apologizing. Dennis Mullenberg is acknowledging the company's software may have been at fault for two 737 MAX 8 jet crashes. Whitney Ward joins us in the studio with more on how Boeing is taking steps to fix the problem. Good afternoon. So Mullenberg's apology was for the families of those who died in the Lion Air and Ethiopian Air crashes. Both of those crashes happened with five months within five months of each other and a combined 346 people were killed. We're deeply saddened by and we are sorry for the pain these accidents have caused worldwide. It's our responsibility to eliminate this risk. We own it and we know how to do it. So the apology came after a preliminary report from Ethiopia's government was released. It's a 33 page report offering a minute by minute narrative of what happened on the flight. It shows the pilots of the March 10th crash performed all procedures recommended by Boeing when the plane started to nosedive. And Boeing is now acknowledging the flight control system on the 737 MAX jets may have been a factor in both crashes. Some people now believe that claiming responsibility is actually just an attempt to get the planes approved to fly again. Now, Boeing leaders believe they do have a software update that fixes the problems, but that fix still has to be approved by the FAA before it can go out. According to the Wall Street Journal, there could also be a second unrelated software issue that also needs to be fixed. That raises the question, of course, of why such flawed systems were allowed to fly in the first place, despite the pressure that Boeing has been under since the Ethiopian crash. So the CEO does remain optimistic and confident, he says, in the safety of the 737 MAX plane. So, of course, we're going to follow this issue and bring you all of the latest updates on the software issue and how Boeing plans to handle it. So Tom, now we'll send it back over to you. Well, we're talking about rain as we get ready to head into the weekend. Keep your umbrella handy. You'll need it at times for this evening as well as over parts of the weekend. Here's a look at the Doppler radar. We have an isolated thunderstorm that is well south of the Ritzville area. But as you can see, all of that rain is tracking up towards the north and the northeast. So we're going to see our rain move into uh, our region. And we kind of think it'll be moving in around maybe 6, 7 o'clock this evening. 90% chance of Precipitation rain occurring at 7 o'clock with a temperature of 53 degrees. Once the rain hits, temperatures cool down into the 40s. 9 o'clock, more rain. Looks like it begins to dry out a little bit in the overnight hours. We'll see overnight lows dropping down into the 30s. And we think that uh, most likely we'll look for mostly cloudy skies on Saturday with showers developing in the afternoon hours. So in the window of opportunity, if you need to get outside and do something right now, looks like it's Saturday morning. By 1 o'clock in the afternoon, it looks like rain will reach develop. Sunday looks like it's just going to be a wet day. We'll look for a daytime high of 55 degrees. At least the overnight lows stay above freezing. 35 the low on Saturday, 40 the expected low on Sunday. All right, Tom, thank you very much. Meantime, infrastructure in the U.S. is at the top of the list now when it comes to improvement needs. A new report breaks it down by project, and it shows bridges in the Inland Northwest are structurally deficient. Mark Hanrahan joins us from the newsroom with some factors that could contribute to our bridge conditions. Good afternoon, guys. The report comes from the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, yeah. and it lists the most traveled bridges that are structurally deficient. For a bridge to qualify as structurally deficient, one of the bridge's key elements is in poor or worse condition. One bridge in Spokane County and four in North Idaho made that list. The deficient bridge in Spokane County is on I-90 over Laytaw Creek. This bridge is used about 40,000 times each day. And just as this report comes out, new research from Washington State University uncovered a hidden risk that could affect healthy bridges. Scientists found commonly used de-icers may be doing more damage than previously thought, and on top of that, the damage is unlikely to be detected during standard inspections. So coming up in our next hour, our Amanda Rowley will have more on the findings from the report on the bridges and WSU's new research. For now, I'll send it back to you guys. Thank you, Mark. 
Well, the smoking age in Washington is officially going up. Mm. Governor Jay Inslee signed the legislation about an hour ago. It raises the state's smoking age from 18 now to 21, and that also includes vaping products, not just traditional tobacco. In a statement, the governor said he's long supported efforts to keep tobacco away from young people. Washington is the 10th state now to raise the smoking age. Mm.